Indeed, I will uh, speak on boosting and waning, but in addition, I want to indulge in a lifelong hobby of mine that is to promote renewal equations as a very nice tool for formulating and analyzing models. But first, let me mention that I enjoy very much to be here in this conference. Uh, so Jean-Christophe, merci beaucoup. Okay, so what I plan to do is first introduce the various ingredients of the model. And they are three, basically. There is a pi, there is a lambda, and there is an f. And then I will uh, formulate the renewal equation. And often I abbreviate renewal equation. And as a side remark, let me mention that in the early days of mathematical biology, there were the pioneers like Lotka, Volterra, Feller, Kermit McKendrick. They all used renewal equations. And if you look nowadays, nobody uses renewal equations. Well, a few people, very, very few. Uh, and in particular, I want to mention um, that Kermit and McKendrick, in the 1927 paper, formulate a model in terms of a nonlinear renewal equation. And there's so many people that quote this paper and don't read it. So I say this again because I encourage everybody that is interested in epidemic models to really read the 1927 paper of Kermack and McKendrick and to see the renewal equation in there. Anyhow, I will introduce this renewal equation in the, in the present context, which is a little bit more complicated. It's a, an abstract renewal equation in some sense. Uh, but I will show that by the mathematical technique of successive approximations, you can quite easily solve it. And that's in terms of generation expansion. That it, I mean, the successive approximations have an interpretation. I will emphasize the interpretation so you can see the meaning of all the terms and in this way solve it. And then arises the issue of a stable distribution, whether the asymptotic behavior is described by an invariant and stable distribution. And then we are in for a little bit of uh, disappointment because I will have to admit that I'm not able to really say much about uh, this, the existence or not exist, non-existence of a stable distribution. So it's a, the, the more uh, nice looking way of saying this is there is an open problem, but uh, I think disappointment is a more fair uh, description. Uh, but then I will uh, look at a modification of the model, a kind of brute force change in the model ingredients, in particular in the, the graph of this uh, boosting map F, and then we can uh, go over to also discuss stable distribution, and then I will put some discussion. So that's the, the plan. So let me start by looking at these uh, ingredients. And uh, I should first mention that the key independent variable in my story is what I call immune status. And it's a positive real number. And here, of course, then I automatically admit that this is very much a caricature because the immune system is far more complicated than to be captured by just a single scalar, so by a scalar quantity. Uh, but still, you have to, to realize that uh, very often immunity is in a zero-one way described. Either you are immune or you're not immune. And so this is a more quantitative fine-tuning of that notion. So it is a step in the right uh, direction of really taking immune status into account. And then uh, the other independent variable will be the age of an individual. And actually, what I will look at is the distribution of the immune status of an individual during its life. And I will ignore this, because uh, later on you can uh, introduce that if you wish, if it is independent, which I will assume. So we're looking at a disease where there is no disease-induced deaths, not at all. So therefore, I can look at an immortal 
individual and later on take the stable age distribution into account if I want to look at population averages. Now this immune status, if nothing special happens, is waning, meaning that it decreases with age according to some differential equation. And as a particular example, you should think of um, uh, exponential decay, where this decay rate is like a parameter. And let me also mention right now that I introduced these ingredients, but of course, I don't know really what, for instance, this parameter is. So you really have to think about all this in terms of an inverse problem that ultimately the aim is to look at data and infer in things about the parameters in the model in, uh, about the ingredients. So the, I introduced the ingredients, but ultimately the aim is to do the inverse problem of having information about the ingredients from data. So waning. And uh, then at birth, there is a certain birth state for the immune status, which is another parameter. So also this one is uh, not uh, really known. But this pi that I want to, um, to introduce as the first uh, ingredient is the solution operator of this OD, ODE. So y is actually pi as a function of a and this state at birth. But more generally, pi maps the state at some particular time to the state at some time later. It need not be from birth to the current age. It can be from any time to any other time. Pi maps the current state to the state as much time later as the argument here says. So that's waning. Then the second ingredient, lambda, is the force of infection. So lambda is the force of infection. And again, I will ignore the feedback loop that is inherent in epidemic models. I will consider lambda as a parameter. So it is a linear problem in the end that I will discuss. And we assume for the time being that this lambda is a given parameter. And so you have to think of this lambda as the intensity of a Poisson process that can hit the individual that we consider. So uh, meaning that it gets into contact with a pathogen. And then when it gets into contact with a pathogen, something happens. And that's now what this last ingredient F is all about. So first we had this y-axis and we have waning, where you just move down the y-axis when time progresses. But then when this uh, Poisson process hits, I put, say, B for bacteria here, and there is a certain dose that is yet another parameter. And if when it hits, your immune status is y0, then this Poisson process brings you from the axis to right here. So where you have this uh, bacteria load obtained by the dose that you get from someone else that transmit this to you. And then you get the struggle between the immune system and the invader, the pathogen. And so at first, it looks like the pathogen is going to win, but ultimately, the immune system is the winner. So you go down again. And this is like what, what we call an infection episode. So I will very much use what we call a two-phase model, where you have, on the one end, waning when there is no pathogen. And then I have this interaction when there is pathogen. And I will not try to put both components in one model, but I really look at them as two separate building blocks and so I don't pay any attention of how to really glue these things into one thing of what's happening inside. I will just describe at the moment uh, this process. And here I will use timescale separation, meaning that uh, all of this dynamics during the infection episode is going very fast compared to this waning of immunity and compared to the aging of an individual. And so the typical example of why to think of is the antibody titer against pertussis toxin in one individual. 
And if you get pertussis, you suffer for a couple of weeks and maybe two months, but you live for 80 years. So it's a relative to your, the length of your life, a short period. And I will idealize, idealize that by saying that it's instantaneous. So you have an instantaneous map from why not to the ultimate F of why not. And so that's the meaning of this F, this boosting map F. So this uh, uh, effect that the Poisson process hits, and then you uh, go from why not to F of why not, oh, that should be enough, I call uh, the boosting map. Now, what is this boosting map? And there is a paper in Epidemics, the journal Epidemics, a couple of years ago. I, I forgot the precise uh, uh, year, but uh, it, it was by uh, Wilfred de Graaf, Mirjam Kretschmar. Oh, that's wrong. Ah. Sorry, Miriam. Sorry, Miriam. <laughs> uh, and Peter Tönes. Uh, they both work at the Public Health Institute, and it was uh, about a submodel for this infection episode, where we assume that during this short time period, and tau is the time variable in this short period, we have. Uh, essentially exponential growth of the bacteria, but uh, then the effect of the immune system is that they reduce that growth, and we don't take mass action here, and i tell you in a moment why not, and we assume that Y itself here, rather than the waning that we had before, is growing also exponentially, with the mu one bigger than the mu naught, so that we make sure that Y is the ultimate winner. And the great advantage of uh, doing this somewhat non-mechanistic term here is that if you start with initial conditions like this, that indeed, after some time, B goes down to zero, which in general, if you have mechanistic, say, mass action type models here with a factor B here, it only goes asymptotically exponentially to zero, but never hits zero. But here it really hits zero. And so if we consider the solution of this and look at the time, which depends on the why not. So I consider this as a fixed parameter, but this is like a variable. Where it hits zero, then the, y, the, the f of why not is actually why not e to the mu one T of y not. That's the formula that gives you the map f. And it's, just, it's so simple that you can explicitly calculate what this map f is, which had the great advantage that when uh, this was by Peter Teunis uh, applied to um, long longitudinal data, so following patients uh, or people infected uh, by pertussis during time, he could estimate the parameters by using Markov chain Monte Carlo type methods, which were uh, relatively fast because we have explicit expressions for these maps uh, in terms of the parameters. So he could estimate uh, parameters for this. Uh, and then uh, uh, the key features are what the graph of F looks like, and that's in that picture over there, where the um, the things to note are that uh, there is here like a, a minimal value, which I call y critical, and that there's quite a difference what happens when y is at the moment when this Poisson process hits is already very large, or a bit large, because then, okay, y increases a little bit, but not that much. So this is what we call from here on a mild infection. Whereas if y is actually uh, below this yc, then you see that you can go quite, uh, much, uh, quite a lot up in the y level due to the uh, hit of the Poisson process. So that we call a severe infection. 
And uh, this is a feature that in many more within host models, uh, or at least in one more mo uh, within host models, uh, by Jane Heffernan and uh, Matt Keeling for measles was also found that you have this two-to-one relationship between the immune status before the phosphon process hits and after. So that's the key feature of, uh, of this model. And Peter Teus actually was uh, uh, reanalyzing data he had analyzed before with other types of models, and in his opinion, it really uh, was a very nice way of uh, summarizing the, uh, the data in just a few parameters and, and leading to some interpretation. So he actually continued to uh, use it in the, in the context of Q fever and slightly uh, complicated the map a little bit with one more parameter. And, uh, so he's still using this technique. But what I want to do now is to see whether we can use the same kind of ideas of this waning Poisson process and boosting in the context of cross-sectional data. So if you have of a population samples where you know from individuals their age and their value of Y, can we from this information, this kind of information, get some idea about the processes that go on in this individual, especially this waning. And for pertussis, this is quite relevant because uh, for some time it was believed that vaccination against pertussis was very efficient, but now there's more and more doubt about it because pertussis is on the rise again. It's partly uh, due to uh, other strains that become more prominent, but partly really to uh, the immune protection of the vaccine waning during the life of an individual. So that is the, the kind of motivation that we do here. So then, what we introduce is y of a, which is a stochastic variable. And by the way, this is a um, piecewise deterministic Markov process that I will describe, because both the waning and the boosting is fully deterministic, and the only stochastic element is in this phosphon process and its rate lambda at which uh, the force of infection strikes. So, uh, it's, it's mostly deterministic, but there's this one uh, uh, stochastic element. That's why the Y of A, which is the immune status of one individual at age A, given the Y of B at birth, uh, is what we want to consider. And how do we uh, consider that? Oh, no, that's the wrong one. Uh, I want to introduce the variable QT that has both an immune status as an argument and a set. So the immune status is in, uh, uh, it's somewhere over there, in R plus, so it's in zero to infinity, and gamma is some subset of zero to infinity, Borel measurable subset of zero infinity. And what is this Q? This is the probability that y at a plus t belongs to this set gamma, given that y at a is the little y. So capital Y at a is the little y. And as you see from the notation, this does not depend on a. So it's only the length of the time interval that matters, not where on the time axis we are, because everything is autonomous, so you have translation invariant. So the, the A is in, in, not uh, of uh, any importance here. Now, the traditional approach to, to work with this would be to think that this, this Y has a density. So you would say this is the integral of a little q that depends on T and some variable psi and is parameterized by this Y with respect to psi. So the, the capital Q, which is a measure because it, it is... Uh, uh, as argument has set, uh, if we assume this has a density. And then for this density, you have the Kolmogorov uh, equation. So you have uh, the Kolmogorov forward equation, dq dt plus ddA, sorry, ddy minus gq. This is the movement down the y-axis due to the waning, 
And then we have the hitting of the proton process, and then the reappearance at another place because of the boosting map F, so you get plus the same lambda times Q, but with transformed arguments because you jump uh, due to this boosting. And in fact, uh, this is the Komogora forward equation, and then you have to look backwards, so you have the arguments are, if the argument here is say psi, it's the, uh, the inverse, and there are, as you see, two branches to the inverse uh, in the psi that enters here. And in addition, in this uh, Kolmogorov forward equation, you have to take into account that this is in terms of densities and only numbers are conserved. So in terms of the densities, you have to transform uh, in the right way so you get also the derivative of f in these points and then minus one in, in uh, these terms. So it's a PDE, which has a simple part, that's this part, and a more complicated part with transformed arguments. Now, the initial condition here is that uh, Q of t and psi with parameter y is actually a Dirac, because you say uh, at the given time, where, at the time where you start, though well, you know uh, that's the assumption. So, uh, and in fact, there is some smoothing in this equation, but it's not instantaneous. So you you have this measure. Yes. Yes. Thank you very much. This was uh, a stupid mistake. Thanks. Uh, so actually, for a while, you have this. Um, uh, measure character, and in fact, if you think of this, uh, uh, but in terms of measures, so let me also send this up now. Then you have a first contribution that I call QT with a little zero here. Y, uh, y gamma, which is just uh, the probability that there is no hit of the Poisson process in this interval of length t, so that's minus lambda t, and then where you are if you just wane, so if, and, and that's very simple because you just move according to this uh, uh, pi, so according to the ordinary differential equation, so the uh, uh, this is the explicit expression. So you should read this Dirac notation as this quantity is one if this point belongs to the set and zero otherwise. So there is this measure component. And therefore, uh, rather than working, uh, if you want to do it in, PD, in terms of PDEs, you have to look at the backward equation on the space of continuous functions and then take duality. And so it, it's possible to do it in PDEs but you have to, uh, uh, to take care of some complications. Now, I want to emphasize that in contrast, I think the renewal equation is very straightforward. So what is the renewal equation? It says that QT at Y and gamma is, well, either there is no hit at the Poisson pro of the Poisson process in this uh, uh, interval of length T. Either there is no hit, or there is at least one hit. So then, we distinguish according to the time at which, this first, the, at which the first hit occurs. And that's because it's a Poisson process, so you have a survival that it hasn't hit before times the rate at which the Poisson process hits. So that's the probability density function for the time during this interval zero t that the first hit uh, occurs. And then uh, you know for sure that if uh, it hits at time tau, you have still t minus tau time to go to arrive at the current time uh, uh, t. And where do you start then? Well, you start at f pi tau y. Uh, yeah. And you have to end up in gamma. And you integrate all this over tau. So once again, what does the renewal equation say? The probability that you are in this set gamma, given that you started time t ago in y, 
is this probability that you do so without any hit in this time interval, plus the possibility that there is a first hit in this time interval, then that you uh, take into account at what time exactly in this time interval it occurs. And then given that time, you know how much time is still left to move, and you know where you start, because you first went down by waning and then went up by boosting, and so that's where you kind of restart. So that's the renewal in the, in the whole process. So that's the, the renewal equation. It has a very clear interpretation. Yeah. Sorry? Well, he, this is Q, but not Q0. So that will come uh, soon. Just, it's, it's coming soon. It's, that's exactly the generation expansion. Because I like to rewrite this uh, renewal equation now in a slightly more uh, easy way as a convolution uh, with a kernel B1. And what is B1? B1 is also, so all these things are called kernels. Bt1 is the um, uh, integral from 0 to t, this same thing here. But now you only pay attention to where you are uh, when you kind of re-emerge when the Poisson process hits, so where you disappear from uh, the place where you were and reappear at some other place. So this is like a burst process, if you consider the disappearance as death and then the uh, uh, the re-emergence at another position as a burst, and this is like a burst operator. And what is this, uh, this convolution product? Yes, absolutely. Thanks very much. That's, uh, and I, I predict that uh, when time goes on, I make more and more of that kind of... Uh, writing mistakes, so please, uh, I welcome all corrections. Um, and what is this uh, convolution product? So if we have uh, two kernels, then it's the convolution both with respect to time, but also where you end up after a certain time and then restart. So you have uh, exactly that structure that is in, in here. Uh, where you restart in Z, and, and so uh, this is the DZ that's already... That's the definition of the convolution product. So you, it's just a matter of bookkeeping. You, you uh, have this uh, both time aspect and then where in the state space you are at that time and then start, restart again. So that's the definition of this uh, phi. And then we just iterate bk plus 1 is b1 bk for k bigger than or equal to 1. And in particular, what is the b2? The, and I, there is a formula for all bk's, but uh, let me just write the thing for uh, b2. So it's uh, an integral over a a domain that I will specify in a moment, and then you have two hits, and uh, uh, this type of thing, and then you have a Dirac where you go for f after tau two when you have first tau one y. This is a tau one comma y. I hope it's still readable. And then it's always difficult to see how many brackets you have to take, gamma, and then uh, d tau 1, d tau 2. And this omega 2t is the set of all tau 1, tau 2, where, uh, first of all, tau 1 can be anywhere in the interval 0 to t, but then tau t 2 should be uh, such that it is um, uh, less than or equal to t minus tau 1, so that when you add the 2, you are still below t. So this is the, uh, what you asked for two jumps, and bk is for k jumps. And so uh, we want to put all the things together, 
So we, the clan kernel, BC, is simply the sum over K of all the BKs, where you will put all the generations in. And then the theory of uh, uh, Volterra equations tells you that this is the resolvent of this kernel uh, uh, V1, because the Q has now an explicit expression, Q0, plus the convolution of BC with Q0. So there's only Q0 now at the right-hand side. So that also uh, relates to, to your question. So you can uh, get an explicit expression in terms of this uh, uh, expansion. Now, how much terms should we really take into account? That's a question now, because infinite is a, is a lot, too much, uh, if you really want to do calculations. So how much? Well, the way to estimate it is that you have to have lambda times, and then integrate over age. So take a survival probability uh, of the age. Uh, so survival as a function of age of the, inv the individual is not immortal, uh, of course. So you, you take that into account. So this is lambda times the average age you reach uh, in the, the, the individuals of the population uh, reach. And if this is, say, like two or three, then uh, it's reasonable to take uh, two or three terms in the, this generation expansion. But then, of course, the drawback is that the influence of the, the y at birth will be quite important. And also, that is something we don't know much about. Now, this is it's under debate now whether uh, this, in the case of pertussis, is two or three, because people, in general, don't suffer from pertussis more than two or three times in their life. But that, of course, doesn't mean that also in this setting we should take it two or three, because remember this boosting map. So if you are high up and then you encounter uh, the bacteria, then uh, you don't, maybe you don't even notice that this happened. So uh, there is a delicate issue of how to interpret the interpretation. Certainly, if you look at foodborne diseases like Campylobacter, you get it probably th three times a year. Uh, but usually you don't notice because your immune system is uh, uh, capable of taking care. But if you haven't encountered it for a long time, you may actually uh, suffer. And that's, by the way, uh, one of the uh, other uh, motivations for this type of work. Uh, uh, you, in this class of models, you have the effect that more, a higher force of infection doesn't necessarily mean more disease, because it can mean that you circle higher up in this y-axis where you hardly suffer anything at all, whereas if you would have a lower force of infection, you don't encounter the pathogen so often, so your y decreases, and then you really become very ill if it hits again. So that's the context. Anyhow, this Campylobacter type of thing uh, means that we, we are interested in, um, in a stable distribution. So in uh, what the asymptotic behavior of this Q will be when T tends to infinity, and hopefully it's independent of the Y of B. So you, you will get some uh, averaging by this uh, stochasticity of the Poisson process that hits, but kind of smoothes out the influence of YB, and in the end you should get something that is a stable distribution. So I want to pay a little bit of attention to stable distribution. But then I first have to uh, mention that, uh, so I, I take now uh, a dynamical systems point of view. But then I first have to, to uh, uh, tell you that this, uh, kernels, these kernels uh, satisfy the chapman kolmogorov uh, conditions, which means the following, that if you take Q of t plus s y gamma, this is the integral over uh, zero to infinity of Q S Y D Z Q T Z gamma. In other words, uh, if you make like an arbitrary stop in a time interval, uh, the kernel should be consistent. If you go in one step to the end, uh, it uh, or or you make this uh, uh, sort experiment type step stop. Uh, you get the same result. So that's this uh, identity. And you can check it. it. It's a little bit of work. Uh, you first check it for the Q0, which is very easy. And then you check it with this generation expansion. And it's a little bit of work, but you, 
you can do it. And that means that if we define uh, operators on the space of measures by averaging with respect to, um, uh, to this y, so this is the q t y gamma m dy. So m is a measure on this uh, open interval from zero to infinity. And this way, we get a transformation from measures to measures. And this chapman kolmogorov uh, identity is exactly what implies that this is a summer group of operators. So in other words, that this is a dynamical system. So it is a dynamical system. I have constructed the kernel of an operator parameterized by t, such that these operators form a dynamical system. And then the um, stable distribution is a measure such that for all t bigger than or equal to 0, you have this. It's invariant. So this would be, in, in terms of population dynamics, that the Malthusian parameter is 0. No exponential growth, no exponential decay, just... And, of course, this is what happens because we have conservation. We have this immortal individual that jumps back and forth, but it, it, it stays one individual. And if you take a population of individuals, the total number remains constant. So that's why this could be, in principle, possible. Now, I want to introduce a next-generation operator and a... Uh, eigenvector of that next generation operator, such that this holds, where uh, you could interpret this as the statement that R0 is 1. So what is this next generation operator? K to B. It's, again, something mapping measures to measures. So you have uh, this integral from uh, uh, 0 to infinity of the y variable. And then you take just this b1 kernel, but you take it for infinite time. So you, the lifelong reproduction of an individual is what you consider. So it may uh, go on till a time hits in, goes to infinity. And uh, y gamma b dy. So B is like the distribution immediately after a jump, and then K applied to that B is the distribution immediately after the next jump. So it maps distributions at birth, at, so after the jump, to distributions after the, the next jump. And that's why we have this. Now, there is a serum in... Uh, in the reference four in my abstract, which is a joint paper uh, with Horst Thieme and Mats Kienenberg and uh, Alts Metz, it's 6-1, uh, that if you call this equation one and this equation two, it says that, um, that the two problems are equivalent. They are equivalent in the following sense, that uh, if one or oh, let me start with two. If two holds, define B as follows. Uh, you integrate over zero to infinity. You take the B uh, C T uh, and then Y. And then here is this uh, omitted argument here and then uh, m bar dy. Now, this depends on t, but if we have indeed a, uh, a constant burst, then when we define by 1 over t, it should be independent of t, and it is. Uh, so this is independent of t. You can prove that. And satisfies 2. Ah. Sorry, uh, so let me put this one. Uh, it's independent of t and satisfies 2. Whereas conversely, if 2 holds, then we define m as just um, the integral of t not tau applied to b d tau. 
And what is T not tau? It is uh, this thing here, but with this uh, condition that you don't jump. So in other words, the stable distribution uh, over the whole state space is from the stable burst distribution, and then you follow the process where there is no further jump and take all possible times into account, and that gives you the, uh, the formula for n. So you can, uh, you can prove that, and it's in, the, in that paper. So in other words, if we manage to, um, to, solve, uh, to solve this, then we are in business. Now, to some extent, this is very, very easy to solve it. You can kind of uh, an explicit expression. And why is that? Well, notice that we have this YC here. And let's, in the, the manner of this uh, cobwebbing procedure of uh, discrete time dynamics, uh, introduce uh, a Y1 by going to the to the 45 degree line, and, um, and also like, uh, let me call this y2. Now, uh, I should uh, uh, elaborate the k, k to, uh, but I'm getting into trouble with the time. So let me uh, try to sketch it, not by writing formulas, but in the, so first of all, uh, this b, uh, because you always end up above y1, so the, the support of this uh, b bar the support is in the interval from y1 to infinity. So it is, uh, there's nothing, uh, you would never appear out of a jump below the values determined by f. That's impossible, because by definition, it, it's f that brings you there. Now, if you, um, uh, if you take any point here and ask when can you actually, by a jump, enter here, you first have to pass this point here by waning. Otherwise, if you jump before that point, you jump higher. So you never enter in this interval. So first, I'm, that's what I'm going to do. First, in, in, try to convince you that you can kind of get an almost explicit expression for the b in, in this interval in here. And to, uh, uh, to make that explicit, you have to introduce the time to go down from one point to another point. So this is 0 if actually y1 is bigger than or equal to y2, but it is uh, uh, the solution of of pi tau y2 is y1, uh, the solution of this equation, if y1 is less than y2. So it's the time needed to, by waning, to go down from y2 to y1. And so um, in this, uh, if you write down explicitly out what this means using the formula for B1 that is here, you find that, um, uh, that you get uh, that the distribution in this interval here is completely determined by, by actually uh, the, the times that you need to go from here up till there and then so I'm, I'm sorry, it's a little bit uh, messy explanation. But uh, let me give the, the main conclusion. You can kind of explicitly tell what the distribution, the stable distribution is B is in this interval. And then you can go by cobwebbing to the next interval and so on. The only thing you don't know for sure is if you do this, that you get something that is integrable from 0 to infinity. So, the non-compactness of this interval from zero to infinity is a problem. And I think probably it's called this the problem of tightness, because what you want to show somehow that it's impossible that by uh, bad luck, the immune state, or 
good luck, this whatever you want to call it, the immune status escapes all the way to infinity. So you have to, uh, to show uh, that, that actually what the, the expressions that you get in this way yield an integrable function. And so far, I didn't manage. And now, I didn't try very hard because, um, uh, in addition, ultimately, we want to do computations with this. And so you don't want to go all the way to infinity. You want to cut off it somehow. So in the remaining uh, time, let me, so this was the disappointment. So this inability to really rigorously prove that there is a stable distribution to apply this serum, to give them the recipe of how to compute it, and everything. We come close, but don't reach the end. Now, to uh, explain the trick of cutting it off is what if we change the graph of f to, to this. And then, I guess you believe me that uh, if you don't do it as rigorously as this, but keep on do, doing this cobwebbing and cutting it off a little bit higher, you get a system of uh, renewal equations uh, of a higher dimension than the two that I will now describe, but still, it's finite. So you, uh, you can get a stable distribution. So we, we change the graph of f to this. And then, uh, we, we make uh, uh, a description in terms of uh, unknowns that are related to the ones I had before, but are somewhat simpler to work with. I call the probability per unit of time that you have exactly this uh, uh, immune status at time t, b2 of t, and I call this b1 of t, and I claim that you can get uh, the standard renewal equations uh, for these B1 and B2. And once again, if you cut it off higher, you get a system with, of a higher dimension, but still a finite dimensional system. So what are the uh, uh, equations? And I only write down now the equation for B1. B1 of t is uh, e to the minus tau y2 y1 lambda B2 of t minus tau that's one contribution. There's others that I will mention in a moment, but let, me, let us first discuss this one. What does this mean? B1 of t encaptures, encaptured, encaptured, well, uh, contains those individuals that some time ago, namely exactly how long ago you need to, how much time you need to wane down from two to one, uh, what, what was at uh, y2, provided there was no jump in between. So that's this probability. But then in addition, you have terms that are related to the history of B1 itself. And that's, uh, so I need to have this picture available. So that's the, uh, the integral from zero to the tau of y1 to y minus 1, where, where y minus 1 is this point here, where you have exactly, again, that you switch to uh, the level y2 if you uh, make a jump. And then uh, it's uh, gamma e to the minus tama, gamma tau, and then b1 t minus tau, but then if you make this jump at all, you jump to the point f of uh, pi tau y1, and you still have to wane down to y1 before you back in y1, and then also you have to condition that you don't, meanwhile, jump again. So that is the exponential function of uh, uh, y1 and then d tau. And in a similar may way, you, uh, you formulate the equation for b2. And so you, um, the, the form of the uh, renewal equation now is from 0 to infinity, a little k d tau uh, b t minus tau, where you have to to have this Steeltjes integral because you have these kind of difference terms. It's not a smooth kernel in general. You have difference terms, so you need to work with Steeltjes integrals to, uh, to do it. But then uh, it's very simple to, um, 
to have the, the B bar is the K infinity B bar. And so in this case, it would be a two by two matrix and it has an eigenvalue one and you compute the eigenvector and that gives you the distribution. And then using this kind of ID issue, translate it back to a stable distribution. So there is a way by brute force to change the F such that you can get results about the stable distribution. So let me try to, uh, to summarize the main point. So first of all, uh, although in principle you can formulate all these models in terms of Kolmogorov or forward or backward equations, I think the renewal equation is a very uh, simple way of formulating the model and also it is very much related to the uh, generation expansion which you would anyhow do if you analyze the PDE uh, and which is kind of uh, ideal in this uh, situation of a, of a renewal equation. So, I, uh, I hope I, despite uh, having to hurry at the end, that I kind of convince you that it is a convenient uh, framework. Um, ultimately, uh, the idea is that we want to use this kind of, of models to put relationship between various kinds of data, uh, like both longitudinal data, cross-sectional data, and uh, use the uh, framework to, to get relationship between these various kinds of data in order to get better understanding of what waning of immunity that seems to happen for many, many pathogens, uh, really, uh, say, from the operational point of view in the context of transmission models, how it should be incorporated. Of course, you can study it from the molecular biology point of view, and then there's very complicated stories with all kinds of different kinds of cells and so on. Uh, and we are far off from being able to build that kind of complexity into a transmission model, but this is somewhat a step in that direction, and yet such that you can uh, do some uh, epidemiology of infectious diseases at the, at the population level. So that's the kind of uh, ideas. And, and just to mention one more possible application, there is a lot of discussion about Farizella and Zoster, uh, so that's about a herpes virus that once you have been infected with it, it remains in your body and uh, just waits for a good time when your immune system is not that strong to hit you once again, and that's then the zoster uh, episode. And so you could put this kind of thing in uh, here where the uh, probability that there's a resurgence of this herpes virus depends on your immune status. and. Again, your immune status depends on how often you were boosted in between. And this is mainly discussed now because people, in some countries actually, they vaccinate against varicella. And it's unknown what the ultimate consequences will be of that for the occurrence of, uh, of zoster. So that's the kind of applied outlook uh, for this work. Thank you very much. So, Otto, obviously, um, it's not really fair to ask you, but um, one doesn't expect a, 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 an infection to proceed with a pure functional process in the real population. You expect all kinds of correlations. Can one cope with those sort of things? Well, um, it is possible to put the feedback loop into this kind of models. So you get nonlinear versions. Um, Still, I think uh, probably the thing more to worry about is, is force of infection depending on age, for instance, which I completely ignored here. The force of infection was just one parameter. But uh, for things like pertussis, it, it, it is very much sought to be age-related. So you have to put age dependence in, and so I have an infinite dimensional parameter too. So there's uh, definitely this is a simplification in many ways. I, don't, I'm not inclined so much to put um, the nonlinearity in right now because, in some sense, it's completely arbitrary because then I have to specify what infectiousness you generate during such a jump uh, up. So not only I, do I have to specify the boosting map, but also how related to maybe, uh, so where is it, this, this uh, episode over there, what kind of infection uh, material, infectious material is generated by an individual uh, experience such a jump. And that is full of free parameters. So in that sense, uh, it's, it's for free, but, but not very meaningful. Mm -hmm. Further questions? 
Yeah, so uh, I was interested in your what you called the brute force uh, mm -hmm. method at the end. Could you extend that to take further steps of the cobwebbing to uh, sure. get as arbitrarily close to that uh, yes, function over some interval? Yes, and of course you could discuss in that way whether there is a meaningful limit. But uh, that too is, I'm afraid, quite a lot of work. But, uh, but yes, you, know, you can do it, but it gets complicated because, um, and the reason is, so here uh, in this, where did I put it? In this formula here, I, I looked at those that, um, that did the following. So they, they go down from here, uh, so, so I should point here. So they go down from here, but then jump up, go here, and then go down again. But actually, they may jump a second time and get here. So with two jumps before you cross any of these points where I do the bookkeeping, you come here. And then if you have more, you have multiple jumps, and, and so you have more and more terms. So uh, the number of terms in the equation increases with the number of points. And that's a difficulty. And it's not so easy to make a bookkeeping scheme that is uh, elegant. At least, it's a challenge. I think there's another question over there. Uh, thanks for the nice talk. Um, earlier, uh, you mentioned that this, you think of this as sort of an inverse problem where you'd like to infer something from data. Where would the data, what would you measure, and where would that fit in into this framework? So what you would measure is uh, you have uh, data points of combinations of age and y at that age. And then uh, you have to handle those. But that's the idea. Yeah, so they, uh, uh, so, so general practitioners uh, may uh, have uh, lots of patients with pertussis and they may uh, have uh, measured the uh, antibody in their blood, the titer in their blood, and that's the kind of data. One more last question, if there was any. If there was not, then let's thank Odo again very much. Thank you.